so thanks everyone. Um, welcome back from lunch. So th in this lightning talk, I'm gonna talk to you about Trino query intelligence at Apple. So, uh, which is really about like getting to know your clusters a bit better, getting more visibility into them, how they are being used and how they are used over time. So <clears throat> my name is Martin. Um, I'm a software engineer in Apple's data platform team. I work mostly on Trino and Iceberg, and I'm based in London. So the quick agenda is, uh, first of all, I'm gonna show you a high-level overview of the Trino architecture that we have at Apple. This is mostly just to set the context a little bit. Then I'm gonna present to you our Query Insight system. This is how we call this internally. And then I will show you some of the major use cases that we are using this uh, as of today to leverage this data set. <coughs> okay, so first of all, the architecture, just a quick high level overview. Um, so at Apple, we are running a Trino as a service uh, at scale. So we have many internal teams uh, that uh, we enable them to create Trino clusters on demand. So whenever they need some to satisfy some of their analytical use cases, they can come to us and in a self-service style bring up uh, a new Trino cluster. So our architecture has like four main components. So the first one is the data platform UI. Uh, then we have something we call the Trino orchestrator. That's a, that's a web service. And then we have a Kubernetes operator for Trino. And then we of course have the Trino clusters themselves. So most of the uh, logic resides in the Trino orchestrator, which is, uh, as I mentioned, the web service. So that it exposes uh, all sorts of uh, REST endpoints for creating a Trino cluster, modifying Trino clusters, scaling them up or down, stopping them, deleting them, et cetera. Also, if you just wanna list your existing Trino clusters, or you wanna get like more detailed information about a particular cluster, you can uh, interact with this uh, web service. Uh, and then of course the way users interact with this overall system is via the UI. Uh, whenever this orchestrator receives a cluster creation or modification request, then it builds a custom resource definition for Trino, and then it sends that custom resource definition to the Kubernetes server where we have our in-house Trino operator which then reconciles this uh, cluster definition and makes sure that the Trino pods are up and running and they are according to the specification. Uh, so one of the key takeaways from, from all this is that basically this is a self-service on-demand uh, type of system where uh, various teams within Apple can come and create Trino clusters if they need one. So moving on to the Query Insight system itself. So what's the motivation here? So as you could see, as, as I alluded to it on the previous slide, basically the number of clusters can start growing quite quickly. So we have many internal teams and the on-demand nature of the system can mean that the number of clusters are growing dynamically day by day, week by week. Also the clusters are multi-tenant. So um, whenever a team has a Trino cluster, it's not guaranteed that it's uh, necessarily segregated based on use cases. So you might have a cluster which is uh, used both for ad hoc analytics as, as well as for reporting purposes. So it's important to have some fine-grained visibility into what's happening in each of the clusters. So which user is executing which queries, when, how long do those queries execute, which one of them fail. Uh, and so on. And we need this sort of overview both at the cluster level so that uh, each individual cluster owner can see what's happening in their cluster, but also for us as data platform uh, developers, it's good to have a global overview whereby we aggregate the metrics across all of the clusters that we manage. So what's the uh, approach that we have taken to, to gain this sort of uh, visibility into the clusters? So the, the idea is quite simple. We want, like whenever we create a cluster for one of our customers, 
we want to capture all the queries that they execute in their clusters and basically channel these, uh, this information into a single uh, place. So it was quite naturally we wanted to reuse and leverage uh, Trino's existing event listener framework. This has been uh, talked about in some of the previous sessions before. Uh, Trino's, query, uh, Trino's event listener framework has a very powerful concept called query completed event. So whenever your query executes and finishes, um, this event is assembled, which contains not just the query string, but also who executed it, how long did it take, which tables were scanned, which columns were uh, selected, uh, and all sorts of uh, execution statistics around memory consumption, CPU stats. Um, <clears throat> there's actually already a existing open source uh, plugin within the Trino project to, to send these events to MySQL. Um, we decided to build our own event listener plugin because uh, we wanted to sync these events to Kafka instead. We have a central Kafka cluster which is accessible from all of our Trino clusters, so that makes it easy for the Trino clusters to have immediate network connectivity to this Kafka cluster. And additionally, the second reason to build the plugin was to um, tag each of these events with additional metadata. So other than having whatever fields query, the query completed event class has, we want to extend that with um, custom metadata, for example, which Trino cluster ID produced that, um, also Kubernetes level information, like which Kubernetes cluster um, the Trino cluster is running on, um, what, what's the node size, and, and so on. Lastly, I would say uh, it's very important to ensure that this setup is seamless, transparent to users. So we wanted to wire in um, this plugin and all, and all of the configuration and secrets this plugin requires into the customer's Trino clusters without the customers having to worry about configuration management or anything. So this all needs to happen in the background. So here's the, here's the flow of how it's working. So on the left-hand side, you have like a typical data analyst uh, submitting a query to the Trino cluster. So of course the Trino cluster executes the query and eventually returns back the result. But what's also happening is that um, we have automatically configure whenever we bring up a Trino cluster for one of our customers, this Query Insights plugin, as well as some other things that I'll talk about. So the Query Insights plugin will take that JSON, the query completed event, which contains all this rich metadata that I mentioned, and it <coughs> sends it to our central Kafka cluster and all of the Trino clusters are doing this for every query they execute. And then we have a Fling job, an Apache Fling job, which is um, basically listening in real time for these incoming events to the Kafka topic, takes the events, does some data transformation to them, some processing, and it lands it into um, two different places. So it lands the data into Druid, um, which we use uh, mostly for low latency dashboarding. Um, and it also lands it into um, to object storage in Iceberg format, which is our uh, long-term durable storage where we, where we know for sure that the data is kept in place in open formats like Parquet and Iceberg, and uh, they can be used later for processing. Uh, what's also really cool is that we, um, also automatically configure a additional catalog um, for, uh, for the Trino clusters that we create. So this is an Iceberg connector catalog, and this allows the uh, Trino cluster to read this uh, <coughs> like query history, like the query history that the cluster itself produced is readable from the very same Trino cluster because you have that catalog configured with all the storage secrets to, to read from this place. We also configure this access control file in the background to make sure that 
each trinomial cluster can only read the data that it produced, and it's it like other data that other uh, uh, clusters produce is not visible to it. Okay, so then let me quickly cover the use cases. So use case number one for us, uh, for all this data set that we're accumulating is dashboarding. So um, previously the only thing that uh, cluster admins could rely on was the Trino UI. But Trino UI doesn't really uh, keep data around for very long. So if you wanna see like longer term trends, uh, like number of queries that are executed on a given day, the number of distinct users that your system has on a given day, um, the number of failed queries or the top failure reasons, how much data is being scanned on a given day, and which ones are your hot tables. And you can track all of these uh, on a weekly basis or a monthly basis and see the trend lines. Um, this is also very useful for setting alerts. Um, so for example, if the ratio of successful and failed queries go out of bounds, then you can, uh, for example, if you use something like Apache Superset, then you can set up something to, tr to trigger an alert. And of course, the global view is also important for us as data platform maintainers. So um, for us to see like all the cluster activity across all of the all of our customers, Trino clusters is, is also important. So use case number two is self-service analytics. Um, this is all about proactive debugging. So as I mentioned, if you have access to the events that your very own Trino cluster produced from your own Trino cluster, then you can investigate issues proactively without having to immediately escalate the problems to us as data platform owners. Um, so we have some, um, some very encouraging examples already from, our, from some of our uh, cluster admins who can go and investigate noisy neighbor issues, for example, try to recreate uh, the cluster state and the timeline of like which user ex submitted which queries and that, at that point like the entire cluster became slower and then like uh, they can go and investigate like why did those users uh, submit like a flurry of queries at the same time. Um, we also created uh, documentation with example queries so that uh, we were trying to educate some of our uh, cluster admins to, to go and do this debugging themselves. Okay, so lastly, the third recommendation that we're exploring, uh, sorry, the third use case is recommendations. So once we have accumulated enough of this uh, historical data, then we can go and find some improvement opportunities. So we run like, uh, an, we can run an async job, let's say once a week, which looks through uh, the query patterns and try to find, for example, inefficiencies in the queries. And if we do find some sort of inefficiencies, we can surface them to the user via some sort of UI, for example. So one of the first ones that we implemented only for Iceberg, because Iceberg has the uh, partition evolution concept, is that we look through the queries um, for a given table and we try to look for the most typical filter columns for the given table. And if the most typically used filter columns are not actually partition columns or sort columns, that's, 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 a, that's a fairly good sign that they are actually not pruning data files and partitions efficiently. So often there's a drift between like how the table was originally created, but like how it's actually filtered by the users. So we would uh, generate something like uh, on the right hand side, some recommendation. And so the recommendation in this case is like either evolve the table partitioning or actually educate your users that, hey, use the partition columns as well to, to make your queries more efficient. Okay, and lastly, just a, a few potential use cases that we're exploring. So we want to add more and more of these recommendation types. Um, for example, looking through the query history, if we can find similar subqueries, we can surface potentially um, candidates for materialization. 
Uh, we, we also want to um, provide potentially online recommendations. So even before you submit your query to the Trino cluster, if you can use some sort of uh, heuristics or, or something, uh, something based on AI to, to sort of warn the users that potentially the query should be rewritten. And we're also looking at uh, integrating a natural language UI uh, to, to interact with this query insights data that we're accumulating. Uh, because we often find that actually crafting these queries to go into the query insights data and look for the problems can often be substituted by uh, queries like how many queries failed in the last 48 hours. And in the background, that would actually hit the data set and return the natural language response. Yeah. So that's it. Thank you.